Time for us to go the distance. We're going to be doing some problems involving arcling, which means, of course, more square roots. Yes, there were lots of them. So it's good to be able to handle square roots. And that comes with practice, practice, and more practice. So we should be doing lots of practice. And if you're following along with the video, make use of the pause button. See a problem that you think, hey, I should try this out. I'm not sure what to do. Pause me. Try it on yourself first. If you ever get stuck, unpause me. Together, we can figure it out. Well, as I say, the longest calculus journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So let's begin. Our very first problem for today. So suppose we have our parametric curve. We always use R of T to represent our parametric curve. We're always going to assume things are already into vector form. If you have a parametric curve, which is listed as points, just turn into vectors, easy to do. All right, so you have one minus t squared, t squared minus one, and t cubed. And the goal, find the length of the curve from t equals minus one to t equals plus one. Okay, well, that doesn't sound so bad. And indeed, look, we'll start by taking our prime of t. Because our prime of t is talking about how we're moving, right? The, it's the motion. And really when we're talking about distance, we are after understanding something about motion. So we take the derivative of each slot and we say, look, this doesn't seem so bad because it's not, not yet. Maybe never, maybe it will be beautiful all the way through. So our length adding up start to finish, it will be the square root of now Come in here, minus 2t squared plus 2t squared plus 3t squared squared dt. Hmm. Okay, so that's integral negative 1 to 1 of what? Well, here, 4t squared. This is also 4t squared. See, the negative when you square it goes away. So you really have a 4t squared and a 4t squared. That would make an 8t squared. Then you have a 9t to the fourth dt. You say, well, that's definitely not going to factor as a square. See, squares should have two, sorry, excuse me, three terms, right? a squared and 2ab and b squared. So you'd expect three terms if we were thinking it would factor as a square. You're going to see two. Okay, so not a square. But there's something in common. So what we can do is we can pull the common part out. Say, perfect, look, it's a t squared. And you take the square root of t squared, and what do you get? You get t. All right, good. Well, that gives us negative 1 to 1 of t square root of 8 plus 9t squared, dt. Okay, well, what can we do from here? We can do a substitution. So what we can do is we can say, well, Notice the inside, 8 plus 9t squared. Basically, it's like t squared. All the other stuff, uh, just fancy adding on. The derivative of that would be a t, which is exactly what we have out there. Perfect. Almost. Almost. As if it had been planned that way. Because I think it was planned that way. So, here we go. We're going to let u be our inside. So, u equals 8 plus 9t squared, then du would be 18t dt. Well, okay, that's a 1 over 18. All right, so, hmm, let's see, what will this become? Well, let's not worry about the balance for a second. We'll, we'll do that in a, in a moment here. Uh, so the t dt is a 1 over 18 du, right? The t dt, 1 over 18 du. And the square root of u is u to the half. Okay, all right. So that's 1 over 18. And go to u to the 1 half, u to the 3 halves, and then times by the reciprocal, 2 thirds. And then plus c. Well, okay, the 2 and the 18. So that would be uh, 1 over 27, u to the 3 halves. But what's u? Well, that's 8 plus 9t squared to the 3 halves. Okay, so now we know how to integrate t squared of 8 plus 9t squared. So now we're, we're like, great, this is beautiful. So according to this, 
we have, this is equal to 1 over 27, 8 plus 9t squared to the 3 halves, evaluate from negative 1 to positive 1, well, that's 1 over 27, plug in 1, you get 8 plus 9 times 1, that's 17 to the 3 halves, but when we plug in negative 1, well, we're going to get 8 plus 9 times 1 again, right, because negative 1 squared is, is uh, 1, and we're going to subtract 17 to the 3 halves, which means we get a grand total of zero. Wow. Well, that's unexpected. Well, why is it unexpected? If you have a total distance that you've traveled is zero, what does it say about your start versus your stop? Well, it says you've never moved. So you have to be in the same location. So somehow it's, it's, it seems to indicate that we've never moved at all. Now to deepen our mystery, because it does seem to move, in other words, it does seem to change, we can actually plug in 1 and negative 1. And we can see that when we plug in positive 1, we'd be at the point 0, 0, 1 up here. And then when we plug in negative 1, we're at the point 0, 0, minus 1 down there. Somehow we seem to have found Something like a wormhole, allowing us to jump from there to there and taking zero distance. Wow! Wow! That seems wrong. Okay, I think something must have happened. And some, in fact, something did happen. There was a lie. I told you a lie. Now, did you pick it up? Did you see where my lie was? Where was it? Let's talk about where it wasn't. It's not that this is the wrong formula. It is completely the correct formula. There is no doubt at all about that. And it's not that the antiderivative of this function, t squared of 8 plus 9t squared, is 1 over 27 8 plus 9t squared to the 3 halves. Again, correct integral. No doubt about that. Perfectly right. And at this point you're saying, well, you eliminate all the places where an error could occur. The error was here. This step. That was a lie. Do you remember what we said? We said, hey, there's a t squared in there. So you pull the t squared out in front, and the square root of t squared is what? Oh, well, we said, oh, it's t. But that was our lie. You see, it turns out that the square root of t squared is actually not t. And although it feels like it should be, it turns out it's absolute value of t. Because what happens is when you square something, it's always going to end up being positive. So you've lost information about whether what you started with was positive or negative. So that's what's happened is the square root of t squared loses information about the sign. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it really means this is the correct piece. So that's not correct. But it's not far off. We can salvage it. What do you notice about this function? It has a lot of beautiful symmetry. It's an even function, which is to say whether you plug in a positive t or a negative t, the results are the same. Because in the absolute value, it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. The squaring doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. The results will be the same. And we say, look, negative 1 to 1. So what we can do is we can say, aha, this is really 2 integral 0 to 1. So in other words, if I'm going from negative a to positive a, then that's the same as just going halfway. Now pick a side. And just doubling it. We'll, we'll pick the positive side. And now, if I want to go between 0 and 1, I'm in the part where everything's positive, now I can drop my absolute value. So I'll have t times the square root of 8 plus 9t squared dt. Which means I can actually carry out like we did here. So this is the correct antiderivative, sorry. This is the correct antiderivative of t squared of 8 plus 9t squared with the factor of 2, 
So that gives us 2 over 27, 8 plus 9t squared, to the 3 halves, I waited from 0 to 1. So that's going to be 2 over 27. If we plug in 1, 8 plus 9 is 17. So 17 to the 3 halves. If you plug in 0, 8 plus 0, well, that's 8. 8 to the 3 halves is, well, 8 to the 3 halves. Uh, it's hard to simplify that because the square root of 8 is not a nice number. So we'll just write it as 8 to the 3 halves. And there we go. Now the nice thing is it's not 0. So the logic kind of matches with what the problem says. As the problem says, look, you shouldn't be able to jump you know, from this point all the way down to that point and going zero. I don't know. We had to go something. We had to do, you know, there was some travel involved. But we had to figure it out. So this is sort of the be careful. Remember, you got to respect square roots. Square root of t squared. Be careful when you have that. It's really an absolute value there. All right. Wow. What a way to start. I wonder what the next ones are going to look like. If this was the first one, Ah, we've got some good stuff coming. Okay, on to our next problem. Find the distance traveled, or in other words, the length, along the curve, two-fifths t to the five-halves, minus two-thirds t to the three-halves, plus 37, pi squared minus t squared, a half t squared plus t minus one. Now, this is as a curve, thinking of it as points, we, of course, say, look, we'll just turn this into a vector, right function, we can even call it r of t, and now we're into our more comfortable setting. Let's pause for a second and talk about what doesn't matter. What won't matter? I claim the following pieces, the plus 37, the pi squared, the minus 1. None of those are going to make any difference. Can we see why? Well, what are they doing? Well, essentially what they're doing is they are shifting our curve. So in other words, it's like we take our curve and our, we shift it somehow through space. But if we shift our curve, it's still the same curve. It's just changed location. So the distance will still be the same. So that's why we say, look, it doesn't matter our shifts. It will still result in the same length. And that shows up because when we take derivatives, what happens to our constants? They go away. Now you might be thinking, whoa, wait, that's derivative of pi squared. Isn't that 2 pi? No. Pi squared is a constant. And so the derivative of that is going to be 0. I, I agree. It's a strange-looking constant. And so it feels like it should have some more magical properties. But it's a constant. And derivative of a constant is 0. All right. So, here we go. So, our length. We're going to add up 0 to 3. So, going from start to finish. The square root of... Now we come to our first term. Take the derivative. Derivative of 2 fifths t to the 5 halves. Well, the 5 halves comes down times 2 fifths. Wow. Beautiful. Perfect. t to the 3 halves. Here, 2 thirds t to the 3 halves, the 3 halves comes down again. Ah, mwah, beautiful. So what happens is the 2 thirds and 3 halves cancel, and we get t to the 1 half. And don't forget, that's the x coordinate, and we're squaring it. The 37 goes away. Third of pi squared, 0. Third of minus t squared, well, plus minus 2t squared. Plus, come here. Of a half t squared plus t minus 1 is t plus 1 squared dt. All right, there we go. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, let's uh, see what happens. So, hmm, integral 0 to 3, square root. So, we're going to square these out. So, this is like our a minus b. So, it's a squared, a t to 3 half squared will be t to the 3. If you think about the a, b term, right? t 
t to the 3 halves times t to the 1 half is t to the 4 halves, or it's t squared. And the middle term would be 2ab, so we're going to subtract 2t squared. And then we're going to have plus b squared. Well, t to the 1 half squared is t. Now here, plus 4t squared. Okay, that's not too surprising. t plus 1 squared, that's not bad. We've done things like that. That's t squared plus 2t plus 1. All right, so we expand it. Now let's group. So this becomes the integral 0 to 3, the square root of, well, hmm, we have a t cubed, just one of them, t squared. So let's see, you have a minus 2t squared, a plus 4t squared, and a plus t squared. So that'll become plus 3t squared. For t's, we have a t and a 2t plus 3t. And for constants, just 1. Okay. All right. Good. So that's what we have to integrate, if we can. I hope we can. Well, what do you think? Is it a square? Probably not. See, when we think of squares, we tend to think of, you know, a squared and 2ab and b squared. In other words, there should be like three terms involved. We have four. Four terms involved. It's probably not a square. But it's, it seems familiar. It, it seems to call back our good old days in algebra when we see things like this. In particular, look at these coefficients, the 1, 3, 3, 1. It sounds so familiar. Do, do you remember what that came from? The 1, 3, 3, 1 pattern? All right, well, let's recall. It turns out it's tied to cubes, degree three. In some sense, you're like, okay, that kind of makes sense, right? Because when we squared it, we got three terms. So if we cubed it, we'd get four. And what, what do we have? Well, a plus b cubed, if you work that out, is a cubed plus 3a squared b, plus 3ab squared, plus b cubed. See, and the, you know, the thing here is that pattern, 1, 3, 3, 1. 1, 3, 3, 1. Perfect. So in particular, we say, aha, what's underneath our square root is just right. Just right. In the following sense, it's a perfect cube. And that's okay. Look, it doesn't say you have to have a perfect square. Other things can happen. We don't want to lock ourselves into the mindset, okay, it has to be a perfect square or forget it. A lot of times we will get perfect squares, but it doesn't mean that's the only thing that can happen. So we want to be able to be flexible and be able to see that, hey, there's other possibilities out there. There's other fish in our proverbial sea, so to speak. So, what do we have? Well, it's the square root of t plus 1 cubed dt. Another way to write that, that's the integral from 0 to 3 of t plus 1 to the power 3 halves. Well, that's not so bad. That's something we can integrate. So we would do what we do if we just had t to 3 halves. The plus 1 really doesn't do much. It's, it's a shift. But in the grand scheme of things, we really can just do the same thing that we did before. If you're not comfortable with that statement, make a substitution and life is good. But this is one which hopefully is one you can run through your mind and say, yeah, yeah, the t plus 1 instead of t perfect. I, it, it all works out. So here, what would you have? Well, you'd have add 1 to the exponent, 5 halves, multiply by the reciprocal, 2 fifths. Evaluate 0 to 3. And you can check. If you're not convinced, take the derivative. You take the derivative. 2 fifths is a constant. 5 halves comes down. So that gets rid of the 2 fifths. t plus 1 to the 3 halves. And then times by the derivative of the inside. But the derivative of the inside is 1. Now, we're almost there. 
we're almost there. This is great. So this is two fifths. Now we plug in three. We'll get four to the five halves and plug in zero minus one to the five halves. Well, one of the five halves is easy. That's equal to one. Four to the five halves. Well, of course, we can start by saying the four to the fifth, 1,024, and the square root of 1,024 is 32. Or preferably, because it's easier for us to think about, we can say, hey, the square root of four is two. Now do your powers of two five times. Two, four, eight, 16, 32. So it's 32. And 32 minus one is 31, times two over five gives us 62 over five. And we're done. That's our answer. It's a beautiful, brilliant answer. I love this problem. Just because it really forces us to say, whoa, it's not a square, but we can still make progress? Yeah, isn't it great? Oh, one of my favorite problems. I, I, I know I'm not supposed to have favorite arc, arc length problems. You know, I'm supposed to say I love all arc length problems equally, but I love this one just a little bit more. A little bit, a little bit. Oh, good, okay, all right. Well, gotta keep going though. There's more problems to love, right? So our next problem, oh, okay. Find the function s of t. Well, what is it? It's the cumulative arc length for the helix cosine t sine t t, where we start time at zero and use this to reparameterize the helix as a function of s. Now it actually gives us a picture here. So you can see it looks like a spring. And of course, spring doesn't sound very technical enough. So we call it a helix. Now, suppose we didn't have the picture. Could we figure it out? I think this is a time when we could. See, if you covered up this last piece, so what would you see? You'd see cosine t sine t. When you see cosine t sine t, what you should think of is the unit circle. So it's like we're traveling along the unit circle. Now that's just for x and y, but that's always gonna be what happens for x and y. So, so we're circling about. Now, what's happening with z? What's happening with z is that it says we're, we should be t, right? So that says we are going to increase. So if this, this is cosine t sine t zero, cosine t sine t t will say, start winding your way up. So in other words, as time moves forward, we move up. And so we say, oh yeah, that is sort of tracing out that spring shape, that helix shape. So we could figure out what it looked like even if we didn't have a picture. It's nice to have a picture. It's nice to see things, right? Okay, so let's uh, think about it. So what do we have? So what we have is that we're looking at the length. So the cumulative uh, distance function is really just about length. It's the length from where you start, which in our case is zero, to where you stop, which in our case we call t, right? It's a function of t. So s of t, it's the integral from zero to t. And I'm gonna, one of the things that can throw us off a little bit here is that we kind of have t showing up in a couple of different interpretations. So I'm gonna be really careful here about what I'm gonna write down next. So I'm just gonna say, this is the magnitude of r prime, and I'm gonna switch my symbols. r prime of tau, d tau. This is just sort of, a tau is uh, a gentleman's t. Well, it's actually a Greek gentleman's t, but what I'm trying to say here is that you have two things going on. You have the, the parameter that's associated with your integration, but then you have another parameter that's associated with the bounds. And you, and you don't wanna get them too confused because it's easy to get confused. So if we can avoid it, let's avoid it. All right, well, let's think about what we have. That's the integral from zero to t, magnitude of, well, take our derivatives, derivative of cosine, negative sine. And we're gonna use our simple tau, derivative of sine, cosine. Derivative of t is tau. Oh, sorry, just one. Got ahead of myself. Okay, d tau. Well, okay, so that's integral zero to t of what? 
Well, the square root of, square the first term, sine square root of tau, square the second term, cosine square root of tau, square the last one, one squared, d tau. But I think you can see what's gonna happen here. Something really nice. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. So we say, hey, what do we really have here? This is one. So we really have one plus one, which is two, which is square root of two. And what do you know about square root of two? Well, it doesn't change. It's always square root of two. It's a constant. So you can actually pull it all the way out. So you can get square root of two, integral zero to t of d tau. Well, that's not so bad. You know, essentially, it's the integrating one. So it's tau, there's a square root of two in front, from zero to t. And we end up with square root of t times t. When you plug in zero, you get zero. Okay. So that's our cumulative distance that we travel. So if we've gone time 10, the distance we've traveled is square root of two times 10. If we've gone time root two, the distance we've traveled would be root two times root two or two, and so, so forth and so on. So we have this nice relationship. Now, in our case, we say, hey, this is so simple. I can solve for t in terms of s. Now, in any setting, you can theoretically solve for t in terms of s, but it gets messy in some cases. But this is a case where it's not looking so bad. It's looking like we can pull it off because we can pull it off. So we say, aha, if you give us a distance we've traveled, we can figure out the time. Namely, our time is one divided by root two times our distance traveled. So this is telling us how we should think of time. So in other words, I can replace time by s in this way. So our new parameterization would be cosine t becomes one over root two times s, sine of t becomes one over root two s, and t becomes one over root two s. And what this allows us to say is it allows us to say, where are you at when you've traveled exactly five units, 20 units, seven units, pi units? It doesn't really matter what number it is. Whatever number it is, you plug it into here, and that says, this is where I've at, I'm at. This is exactly where I'm at the moment I've traveled s units. So that's what we mean by the reparameterization. We've now completely described our, our travel along the curve in terms of the distance we've traveled. And so that's that's that. We're actually done. We finished it. Woo! Nice. Okay, well, hmm. I think we have time for one more. Okay, let's hope it's a good one. Well, all problems are good problems. But some are more good than others. So for t greater than or equal to zero, a particle moves along the curve for t to the three halves t squared minus 3t, and 3 times square root of 3t. Given that starting from time t equals 0, the particle has traveled the total distance of 40 to determine the particle's current location. OK, so we're looking for a location. So keep in mind that our final answer should be a point. What do we know? Um, well, if I want a location of where it's at, I just need to know a time. So in essence, we could say, Aha, instead of focusing on finding a location, we should find a time. Well, time that does what? Well, we need to go a total distance of 40. Now, we see some clues here. The word distance tells us we're in a distance problem. So we should be using the approach to set up the distance formula. And we say, look, the, the distance formula it says length, you add up, start to finish, the square root of, and it's x prime squared plus y prime squared plus c prime squared dt. All right, so that's the formula. We know we see it's a distance problem. We say it's a distance formula. It's a little bit different than most distance problems. See, most distance problems says, find the distance. Here it says, 
the distance is 40. It's like, okay, it's not so hard to find the distance. It's right there. We've, we're done, right? Well, no, it means that there's something else we're looking for. So there's some other piece of this integral that we don't know. And what we don't know is where we stop. We do know when we start. How do we know that? Because it says starting at time zero. So we know our distance is 40. Okay. We know we start at time zero, but we don't know when we stop. If we did, we'd be done. We'd just say, look, if I know when we stop, plug that in, life is good. Don't have to do anything. So that we leave as a symbol. We don't know what it is. But we also know all, the, all our derivatives. So the square root of, okay, x prime squared. Okay, so take the derivative, 4t to 3 halves. The 3 halves comes down. 4 times 3 halves would give us 6. So we have 6t to the 1 half squared. Plus, next, the derivative there, 2t minus 3. So that's the derivative of y. Plus, the derivative of z, 3 root 3. Well, that's a curious number. I wonder why they have that number. Well, oftentimes the reason they have curious numbers is they need it to work out. These are, are not just random problems. They've been carefully crafted, beautiful, polished, so that things work out. 99.9% .9 of the time, if you just throw random things in, you get stuck. These are the beautiful ones, the most glorious of calculus problems, the ones that we can actually solve. Okay, well, I should say the ones we can solve by hand. Once we bring computational tools in, we can always get good approximations. But right now we're learning to think. We're not here to learn to enter things into a computer. No, no, no. We're learning to think. Okay, so let's clean this up. What do we have? The square root of, well, the square of this term, we get 36t. Okay, that's not bad. Here we'd get uh, 4t squared, that's our first term squared, minus 2ab, right? Minus our cross terms. So that would be minus 12t. So 2 times 2t two times 3, plus 9, which is negative 3 squared, plus, okay, now we've got to square that, 3 times root 3 squared uh, turns out to be 9 times 3, or 27. Okay. So integral 0 up to b, square root of, let's just put this, uh, we should group, and we should also have the powers decreasing. It's a polynomial. So the highest power is a square. There's only one term with the square, so it's 4t squared. There's a 36t minus 12t. That makes a 24t. There's a 9 and a 27. Well, that makes a 36. Okay, good. Well, hmm. All these terms have 4. Let's go ahead and take that out. Square root of 4 is 2. So... This will be integral 0 to b of 2. So we factored a 4 out of each term, and that square root of 4 became 2. So we'll be left with a t squared plus 6t plus 9. And now we say, well, does that factor? And it does. Do you see it? Yeah, it factors suspiciously nicely, right? It's a square. This is the quantity of t plus 3 squared, because that would give us t squared plus 6t plus 9. So we say, brilliant. So this would be 2 times t plus 3. Or if you like, and grow from 0 to b, of 2 times t plus 6. Now, you might be saying, oh, Steve, you got me once. You're not going to get me again. You took the square root of t plus 3 squared. Don't you need an absolute value there? Okay, technically you would, but what do we see? We see that t is positive because we're told t is positive. So t plus 3 will be positive, so the absolute value isn't needed. We only need to worry about absolute value if what's inside the absolute value could be negative. But we pay attention because these things can happen, but we're okay here. And now we're looking at this and we're, we're, we're excited. 
This is this is stuff we can integrate. It becomes t squared plus 6t. And we need to evaluate from 0 up to b. Well, plug in 0, you get 0. And plug in b, you get b squared plus 6 times b. Now, do you remember what we're shooting for? We want this to equal 40. See, b squared plus 6b, you follow it through, do, 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 is 40. All right, so now we do a little bit of rearranging. And we say, well, that really t says what? It tells us we want b squared plus 6b minus 40 to equal 0. So now we start thinking, OK, uh, I need two things that multiply to give 40, but whose difference is 6. Well, 40 sounds like 4 and 10. And you subtract 4 from 10, you do get 6. So that tells us, OK, it's probably going to factor as a b and a 10 and a b and a 4. We just have to figure out whether it's plus minus or minus plus. Because it's a plus 6b, I think we'll put the plus on the bigger term. Let's check to see if that works. So we'd have b squared. That's good. Then we'd have minus 4b plus 10b. That's 6b minus 4. OK, good. Now we say, hey, hold on. Oh, we're, we're in trouble. Because it looks like we're getting two possibilities, right? Namely, b equals negative 10 or b equals positive 4. They can't both be right. Well, right, they're, they're not both right. We can quickly eliminate one of these as a possibility. Which one? We can eliminate the negative 10 because we need our time to be positive. Remember, we've said it before, and we can say it again. Our time is greater than or equal to 0. And b indicates a time. So we don't want a negative time because we're not considering that. So we say, aha, perfect. That says b is 4. And are we done? No, we're not done. But we're close. Because remember, what were we looking for? What was the whole point of the problem? Well, it was to find a point. So our answer needs to be a point. So we take a look and say, OK, how do we get our point? Well, we now have a time. We now know that at time 4, we're going to be in the right location. So we take this 4 and we plug it in. OK, so we end up at, uh, so at time equals 4, we're going to have 4 times 4 to the 3 halves, comma, 4 squared minus 3 times 4, comma, 3 root 3 times 4. Well, OK, 4 to the 3 halves, that square root of 4 is 2, 2 cubed is 8, times that by a 4, that gets us to 32, that's in our x coordinate, 4 squared is 16, minus 12 is 4, and the last one would be 12 root 3, and that is where we're at. So. When we have traveled the distance of 40, this will be the location where we are at. And uh, we're done. Now, one thing you can see, because we start, if you plug in t equals 0, it starts at 0, 0, 0. Well, look, we changed a lot in the x coordinate. 32. That says, look, you've gone a long ways in x, because you've gone a total distance of 40. So almost all our motion is in the x direction, whereas and now in the y, you've only gotten four. That's not very far at all. Well, you know, that's OK. The th important thing is all combined, we travel a total distance of 40. All right, well, what a fun set of problems. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Keep at it. Keep practicing, because the more you practice, the easier this all becomes. And we'll hope to see you again in a future session.